If you're in desperate straits, if your life has fallen apart, if you're nihilistic and miserable, and maybe you have your bloody reasons, because maybe you do, that's still the case that if you step outside yourself and you try to make the lives of other people better, that's the best possible thing that you can do for yourself. It, it's defining, you know, what we, what Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, this, this right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, you know, those are, those, those words get thrown around a lot. And some people might say, well, pursue my happiness. That means pursue whatever ends I want, right? Pursue mm -hmm. whatever make, gives me that short-term gratification. Pursue whatever makes me just feel good. And I don't think that's what the founders meant. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence for that because what, what they meant was the per, per pursuing of purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, that, that some sort of purpose in your life is what, what makes you happy. And that, and that there's, there, there is a given set of traditions and social interactions and, and standards of living that genuinely make people happy. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased today to be talking to Congressman Dan Crenshaw who I've had the privilege to get to know over the last couple of years now. Uh, most recently, Congressman Crenshaw set up an event for me in Washington where I had the privilege of speaking to a large group of Republicans concentrating on policy making about the possibility of generating a positive message going forward uh, as a bulwark, let's say, against the possibility of a kind of reactionary populism, which is not optimal, unfortunate for everyone concerned. Dan and I talked after that about doing another podcast, concentrating on political issues, particularly focusing on the danger posed by the radicals on the left and the radicals on the right. He's had a lot of experience with the unpleasant radicals on the right. I thought that would be really interesting. But over the last few days, I've also read his book, new book, uh, Fortitude something Dan knows something about, by the way, Fortitude, American Resilience in the Age of Outrage. And I really liked the book. I thought it was a lovely balance of story, personal story, concept, uh, encouragement, clear delineation of a political and sometimes a theological philosophy, psychological philosophy. So I took a lot of notes and I thought what I would do after I read Dan's bio is walk through his book with him. There's a lot of places where our thinking dovetails, I suppose, which is why it's easy for us to get along. Uh, and I think we could have a very productive discussion as a consequence. So I'll start with the bio. Originally from the Houston area, Representative Dan Crenshaw is a sixth generation Texan. In 2006, he graduated from Tufts University where he earned his Naval Officer Commission through Navy ROTC. Following graduation, he immediately reported to SEAL training in Coronado, California, where he met his future wife, Tara. After graduating SEAL training, Dan deployed to Fallujah, Iraq, to join SEAL Team 3, his first of five deployments overseas. Dan was medically retired in September of 2016 as a Lieutenant Commander after serving 10 years in the SEAL teams. He left service with two bronze stars, one with Valor, the Purple Heart and the Navy Commendation Medal with Valor, among others. Soon after, Dan completed his Master's in Public Administration at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He then returned to Houston, where his community had been devastated by Hurricane Harvey Inspired by their subsequent volunteer work, Dan and his wife Tara decided that the best way to serve the people of Texas would be in elected office. And so in November 2018, Congressman Crenshaw was elected to represent Texas's second congressional district. In Congress, he serves on a number of important committees, including the House Energy and Commerce and the House Select Committee on the Cli Climate Crisis as well as the Health and Environment and Climate Change Subcommittees. So, Congressman Crenshaw, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me again. Uh, it's much appreciated and uh, kudos on your book. How is the book doing, by the way? Uh, pleasure to be on, Jordan, appreciate it. Uh, it's doing, it, it did really well. Um, it, it came out, it's a little old at this point, 
um, came out in 2020 and uh, did, did quite well um, because it, it wasn't a political book. I think um, there's definitely a ceiling for politicians to write a book as far as how many, a ceiling as far as how many they'll sell. Yeah. Uh, I think we did much better than that simply because it's not a political book and it, it's not even a seal book. Um, it's a little mix of all of those things, but mostly it's a, uh, like you mentioned earlier, it's, it's an ethics book. It's a, it's an yeah. empowerment book. It's a self-help book. It's lessons and fortitude. And it also happened to come out at a time right in the beginning of the pandemic, which was, uh, I, I think a prime time for those kind of lessons. So it did pretty well. Yeah. Well, the book starts with your a discussion of both victimization culture and outrage culture. And you, you make a moral case, I would say against both. Uh, and also, I would also attempt to do a diagnosis of why this has become front and center in some sense. And so on the victimization front, you, you make a case that in some ways, the sense of victimization and the, sec the sense of oppression and, and uh, is opposite to the to a proper sense of gratitude and duty. And I thought that was extremely interesting because obviously there are situations where people feel as if they're being oppressed justifiably. But you can make much of that in a way that's not productive. And by dwelling on that, especially if it's not deserved, let's say, you also deprive yourself of the values of duty and responsibility. And that's a way to undermine the meaning of your life in a most fundamental sense. You deprive yourself of, of the, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you, you deprive yourself of, of any ability to overcome it, right? You deprive, you deprive yourself of agency. And that's, that's a devastating thing psychologically for someone if they're deprived of the tools and the abilities to move forward past, whether that trauma is real trauma, whether that victimization is, is justified, as you said, because I mean, there's two types. There's the, the narratives that get built in our society about victimization, uh, which it can, it can certainly be debated whether it's real or not. And then there's true victimization and, and true victimhood, or at least being a victim of some kind of injustice. But victimhood, yeah. I would say is a bit more of a mindset and you, you can either live that way or you can, or you can decide to overcome it and decide that you indeed are in charge of, of, of your own destiny. Yeah. Well, there's a difference. I think there's a difference between being a seeker for justice and construing yourself as a victim. You know, if you're a victim in some sense, you're owed something, you're owed redress. But if you're a fighter for justice, then, your decision is something like that you're going to move forward to help yourself and others despite the injustices of the world. That's a better way of thinking about it. So you get your agency that way without falling into that, that pit of envy that, that victimization also seems to produce. You also have to define justice correctly. And I think that that's where our, our, our society has, has qualms with one another is this redefining of the word justice and what injustice actually is. And so I, there, I think there is a classical definition of justice and it's 